You're listening to episode 213 of the Master Your Mind, Business, and Life podcast. We're turning up the woo dial today and diving into one of my favorite topics, astrology. We've covered astrology on the show many times, but we haven't discussed how to use astrology to understand our relationships. And when I say relationships, I mean the intimate ones, as well as the ones that we have with our friends, parents, and even children. Today's guest is dishing all of the information we need to know. Natha Campanella is an astrologer who helps you understand your history, identify your blocks and blind spots, and distinguish your powerful gifts using the wisdom of astrology. This episode is brought to you by Spiritually Seeking. When you go to spiritually-seeking.com and enter the promo code PODCAST at checkout, you can save 20% on numerology reports, affirmation cards, and life guidance sessions. Go to spiritually-seeking.com and enter the promo code PODCAST at checkout. Now, are you ready to explore the world of relationship astrology? You know what to do. Tune in, turn it up, let's go. You're listening to Master Your Mind, Business and Life. Conversations with everyday world shifters, truth seekers, and rule breakers. Here's your host, Lauren Smith. Hi, Nava. Welcome to the show. I am not only so happy to have you join me today, but I am pumped because I love nerding out on all things astrology, and I know you're just going to school us today. Oh my God, Lauren. I also am such a big astrology nerd, so I am always down to talk all things astrology, so I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, to get us started, I would love to just learn more about you. What called you to astrology? Oh, well, so, you know, I've always been kind of interested in things that aren't, you know, tangible, right? So even, even when I was younger, I was like, Ooh, I like things like fairies. And then as I got older, I was drawn to things like angel cards and crystals and whatnot. But when I was about 35, I had my first astrology reading and I was sold, you know, she was able to tell me so many things about myself that maybe I had kind of known, but I hadn't been able to articulate, or I hadn't really had sort of the concrete, like, this is what you are here to do kind of information. And it all resonated so closely. I mean, I felt like I told, I told my friend after I left my reading, I was like, wow, it was like talking to, um, like a parent figure that wasn't a parent figure. So I could actually like hear the information. It was just so much wisdom and really helped me to orient. And so from that time on, I was totally hooked. It took me a few years. I didn't start actually formally studying astrology until many years later, but I was dabbling. I was always asking anybody at a party that I was talking to or any friend, what's your birth data? Give me your birth data and kind of (laughs) dabbling. And you know, now that I do it full time, it's, it has not lost its magic. It's still every bit as cool. And I still learn new things every day. Oh, you know, you're so right about that first reading, because if someone's never had a reading before and you go into it, you really don't know what to expect. I think as, as a newbie, you're like, okay, what are you going to tell me? And then it's very, I would say validating for many parts of you. I think that's really a a wonderful word to describe it, right? It's just, it's not, and, and by the way, I always say this, if you, if you find yourself with an astrologer that is not being validating, that is scaring you, it's not a good astrologer because Mm -hmm. really we want to, we want you to feel validated. We want you to feel, we want you to leave the reading going, oh my God, it all makes so much sense now. So that's, that's my goal anyway. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. Because there are sometimes, even if you look on YouTube, there's an astrologer and it's, it's almost like a darker, you know, like they're just bringing out like the negative or like the darker things. And those are the type of people when you see it, it's just like, okay, you're not resonating with me. And I'm one of those people where I take what resonates and I leave the rest. And it's really hard sometimes if you're lined up with the wrong person. So knowing who's key is, is really good. Yeah, I always feel like we're good enough at sort of awfulizing or predicting doom and gloom. Like the last <laughs> thing we need is somebody to 
say, oh, by the way, something's going to go terribly wrong. And really astrology isn't, that's not even what it's for, but I've had so many clients that have come to me that have been scared of astrology for years because they had somebody tell them years ago that they, you know, we're going to be single forever. And I always think like, you know, we don't remember all of the good things that we hear, but we stick on that one sentence. And then 20 years later, you know, you're still going, I'm supposed to be single because that one person said that years ago. So yeah, I stay away from that. You know, you actually just opened up a can of worms because I had an astrology reading last year and it was with, now there was a language barrier. So I will, I will preface that up front and it was Vedic astrology. So that was also new to me, but he and the astrologer had told me that I would never be happy in a relationship. Oh. <laughs> And I like walked away from that, just feeling very defeated, right? I was just like, oh, like never, (laughs) you know? So like when I had told my mentor that she was like, well, there's two things we don't say in life always and never. She's like, so just go ahead and, you know, take that out. But she had to help me shift that mindset around what he had said, because it impacts you very, very deep. And I know we're already on this topic of relationships and that's what we're here to discuss today because- Astrology is multi-layered, but using it to kind of up-level our relationships or even understand our relationships is really cool. And it's a really cool tool to have in your back pocket. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, I think that we all have, you know, astrology we'll say is a combination of fate and of free will. So we can look at our astrology in many ways and say, you know, this is what I came here to do. This is my soul path, but also that we have this free will that weaves in and out. So we always get to decide, you know, in, in your case, like, oh, I'm never going to be happy, but isn't that your decision to make? And so when we look at relationship astrology, there's a lot of that, you know, I'm, I'm happy to tell clients, here are some of the things that you might bring to the relationship that could ultimately cause you some difficulty, but here's the remedy for it. And I think that that kind of information can be really helpful as opposed to just, well, <laughs> here's your struggle. Never- You're not right. going to be happy. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. No, I love the remedies. I love that you highlight that as well, because of course we all have struggles. We all have things that we have, that we're going through that we bring to the table that, you know, sometimes aren't so nice. It's part of doing our work in life and knowing how you can be better and having the remedy for that. Oh, oh man. I love that. I love it so much. And I had kind of told you before we started recording that I have a few friends who are freshly on the dating scene again. And I noticed that the first thing that they do is that they look up the astrological compatibility between their sun signs, because as we know, that's the easiest to figure out from the birthday. But do sun signs really tell us what we need to know when it comes to intimate relationships? I mean, the sun sign is really important sign and it's what most of us know because it's the sign that the sun was in when we were born and the sun represents our sense of self. So it is related to our creative endeavors and, and who we really are when we are being real. So that, so it is important, but there are a lot of other planets that come in, especially when we're looking at like compatibility with a partner that have a say in it. So, you know, if all you know is when this new person's, um, you know, you know, they were born in May, you know, they're a Taurus, by all means, you can look up Taurus and kind of read about it. But the truth is, it's just going to be a a tiny little piece of the puzzle. Um, It would be hard to say, you know, oh, you're a Taurus. That means you're perfect for me or you're not perfect for me. Right. Especially because there's a whole other chart. (laughs) It's like there's. There's a whole chart to it. Where does the moon kind of play into that since the moon is more tied to our emotions? Yeah. I mean, the moon signs are good. When I'm doing compatibility between two charts for a client, I'm oftentimes just looking at the sun and the moon, both both people's suns and moons, and we're looking for compatibility. And so just an easy trick for all of you guys listening is that elements of the same or signs of the same element always like each other right? So Sagittarius and and Aries will understand each other very well. Taurus and Virgo will understand each other very well. So if, if that's all you have is like their sun sign and their moon sign, 
you can know that if you guys share an element somewhere in there that there's going to be some resonance and that resonance is always nice. I mean, sometimes it's more of a friendship kind of resonance than it is like a hot spicy chemistry because when we're looking for hot spicy chemistry, then we're actually looking for signs that don't understand each other very well. And that Ooh. kind of clash, believe it or not, because that's that's where things can get juicy. Right, yeah. And sometimes we're, we kind of go after that juicy a little bit more because it's exciting and it's fun. But then we may realize that, hey, we need that friend. We need that person that understands us. Yeah, exactly. And when we're talking about the moon, like to your question, um, we need emotional resonance. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. What if someone is, let's say I'm a Capricorn sun. So what if my partner has a Capricorn moon? That's good. That's great. I mean, it means that you guys can both relate from that Capricorn perspective of, you know, needing, needing structure and needing a certain level of success and a certain level of organization. And those are such general Capricorn things that that's not going particularly deep on Capricorn, but right. it's nice because you guys, it means that you guys both understand each other, at least when it comes to that Capricorn archetype. Interesting. I have just, I've seen that come up where you see someone's son, you know, and their partner's moon. I was like, that's a, that's fast. That fascinates me. So I've always been a little curious as to what that energetically means. Yeah. Yeah. If you had, um, well, I mean, without going too deep into all the different versions of what moon would be compatible for you, but it is, you can always look even to, even to just to the elements, you know, yeah. and get some good info. Are there certain planets that are more masculine energy versus feminine energy? And do those dictate anything relationship wise? Yeah, that's such a good question because when I'm looking at, a, when I'm looking at relationship astrology, I'm oftentimes looking at Venus, right? Because Venus is the divine feminine. Um, and we all have a Venus in our chart, but Venus talks about what we are attracted to in a partner and what we use, what we have to attract things and people to us. So Venus is really like the sort of the, um, the first sort of archetype that we go to when we are seeking a partner. And Mars is very divine masculine in nature and Mars can be the sexual element, right? Mars can be like the energy, the drive, the, the way that we go after what we are attracted to. So those are two things that you guys can look at if you have at least your own natal chart, you can look at your Venus sign and get a sense of, you know, what is it that I am attracted to in a partner? And what do I bring to the table? And your Venus sign will tell you a lot about that. Ooh, and I think it's really important to know what you bring to the table too, because we can learn about our partner all day long. But if you don't have that deep sense of self-awareness, what good is it knowing about your partner, right? <laughs> like It's almost like you have to be so in tune with you and then you're you're more open to be, flowing and more receiving of them and who they are in their raw form. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that Lauren, because like, that's one of the things that I love astrology the most for is that it is a self-awareness tool. So the more that you understand about what's happening in your own chart, the, the better really, because, you know, we're with ourselves 24 seven, but we have a lot of blind spots, a lot of things that we can't actually see, or we get we get sort of stuck on a story or whatever, and, and we don't see ourselves as clearly as we could. Mm -hmm. And astrology is so good for that because like, let's say we're looking at Venus and I'll use myself as an example. My Venus is in the sign of Gemini. So that is a very talkative, um, witty, sort of curious sign. So what happens for me, and I didn't even realize this until I had an astrology reading and the, and the astrologer started going into my relationship astrology. And I was like sitting there with my jaw on the floor going, wait, <laughs> what, what? So Jen and I, one of the things that an air Venus needs is to be seduced through the mind, right? So conversation. So always looking for like that next interesting person, that next interesting um, conversation, which is great, right? You can, you can have so much fun at the beginning with partners. 
But what can happen is that eventually I can slip into that more negative side of Gemini, which is like, I'm a little flaky. I'm a little bored. I'm a little restless. Mm. And I had never really put that together. Once I put it together, it was like, oh, and so I could watch myself. I'm, I'm married now, but I could watch myself in that dating scene kind of when I would hit that place of getting bored and kind of looking at like, well, who else is in the room and what else is going on here? And just understanding my Venus sign has seriously made such a difference in the way that I relate to partners. That is fascinating. Just the duality of the energies and noticing about it. And that way you can almost, I would say it's almost like an ego check, right? Like yes. you notice that something's happening and it's, oh, someone else is around the room and it gives you that ego check. Like, nah, <laughs> we're going to, we're going <laughs> to stop for a second. We're already with someone. Our eyes can be there. Let's evolve that a little bit more. Yes, exactly. Because Venus, our Venus signs by nature are going to be a very flirtatious because that's what we're doing. We're attracting, mm. right. And we're attracted, but you know, there's sometimes when we need to turn off that, like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not attracting right now. I'm actually kind of interested in this person that I'm with. So I want to yeah. tone that down and boost up the good parts. Like how about an interesting conversation with the person I'm with kind of thing. Yes. You're making me want to learn more about my Venus. I, I'm also an air Venus. I, mine's an Aquarius. Um, mm. So when you said chatty, I was like, oh, <laughs> hmm. <Yeah>. me talkative. <laughs> no, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the things for all of the air Venuses is the getting bored Yeah, is such a, it's such a difficult part of it because the mind does with all of the air signs. And this is true of the air signs across the board, regardless of which planet, but all of the air signs are just the mind moves so quickly yes. that it's always, you're like, I'm processing. I want more information, more, more, more. And the minute that flattens out, then it can be a problematic, but we can also know, okay, I can, I can work with this. There's another, there's another way to handle it. Absolutely. Now, where do the houses come into play? I know a lot of people are always like, tell me if I'll get married, how many divorces are gonna, am I going to have? Does that show up in astrology? I mean, so there are some kinds of astrology that are very predictive in nature. So for example, Vedic, like you had an, you had a Vedic reading. Yeah. Um, Vedic tends to be very predictive in nature, whether it's accurate. I don't really know because I practice evolutionary astrology. Um, but you can look at the houses. The seventh house is the house of intimate partnership of long-term partnership. And you can get some ideas of what's going on. You know, what your perhaps relationship trajectory might look. But it's also a little complicated. Like I wouldn't necessarily recommend a novice go in and try to dissect your seventh house because, you know, for example, I have Saturn in my seventh house and Saturn is a planet that makes you work really hard and can bring difficulty. So if mm -hmm. I was like a newbie and I saw that, I might think, oh no, I'm, I'm no, I'm, I'm, I'm doomed. Really doomed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you know what it, what it really has done for me is it has made me work very hard through various relationships to understand myself more and, and really get to a place where I can have a long-term fulfilling relationship. So yes, there's a, there's a lot of good info in the seventh house. You also need a really accurate birth time to get to be able to get the accurate houses just for anyone listening. Yeah. But I would say, you know, look at your Venus sign first, if you're really curious. That, that's really interesting too with, with the birth time. A lot of people don't know their birth time. How do you rectify that if you're like, oh, my mom said I was born sometime in the morning? Yeah. I mean, a lot of times what will happen is I will have a client who has sort of an idea. I'll say like, yeah, my mom said I was born around lunchtime. And then they'll, I always ask in my intakes, you know, is there anything that's really activated for you in your life? And they will go into the story and sometimes even using that, I can tell as I, cause I will do a chart where I can kind of watch as the time ticks by what's happening in the chart. Um, but another thing that I will do with clients is I will sort of ask them blind questions, right? If we're between, you know, like one or two rising signs or we're between one or two moon signs, I'll ask questions, you know, about their life and usually get a pretty succinct answer. And then 
we can kind of do the reading in that way. Yeah. And you just kind of see like which one resonates based off of, of their story and kind of matches up to those traits or characteristics. Yes. And, and, you know, if you have no idea of a birth time, we can still do a really thorough reading because the planets mostly don't change, right? The planets are in the same place and the same sign all day on any given day. It's just the moon and the rising and the houses that will change based on the time. Fascinating. Oh, I love that so much. Now, will you tell us, are there different t- like different transits that are likely to kind of ruffle up some relationship feathers? Yeah, for sure. So a transit is what the, it speaks to what the planet is doing in the sky right now. And then we all have a natal chart, which is the map of where all of the planets were when we were born. So when we're looking at what's happening in the sky, sometimes there are planets that are connecting to our birth chart, but even on a broader level, you know, if Venus, for example, is doing something funky in the sky, we're probably going to feel that. Or if like Venus goes retrograde, probably going to feel that. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can get really detailed by comparing and contrasting what's happening in the sky with what's happening in your own chart, or you can just, you know, read Instagram and know, oh boy, Venus is in retrograde or okay, Mercury is in retrograde. So that means that I need to be very on top of the way I'm communicating. Yeah. Yeah. And you just kind of use that as, as a reference to just know the energy. Exactly. And, you know, astrology is, I've talked to so many people that find it really frustrating because it's such a big map, uh, which it is, right? So if you're in there trying to understand transits and degrees and the way that the planets interact, you're going to get overwhelmed. So always just start, just start very small, right? Start by really understanding, for example, your moon sign, because the moons will always come up in relationship because it's about our emotions or Mm. your Venus sign that will always show up in relationship. So there's so many easy ways that you can approach it. Now we have used, we've talked about this of using astrology with relationships in a romance way or an intimate way. What about with just kids or parents? Can we also use astrology in our relationships in that type of tone? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I find it really, really valuable to do relationship readings with clients. And in those, we do all sorts of stuff, romantic parents, kids. Um, it, it helps to kind of understand where somebody else is coming from and what they're here doing and what their tendencies are compared to what you're doing. Because then again, we can bring in that remedy of all right, so you two don't communicate very well together, but here's how you can support conversational flow. Here's how you can support emotional resonance, right? So it's a really cool way to get some inside answers into relationships that you couldn't see otherwise. I think that's really powerful too. I can I can kind of picture doing that with with my children because they are both very different people. And I think that one of my perceptions when I had kids is like, you get to mold them how you want them and they'll just be the people that you want them to be. And then, hey, nope, reality hits you and you realize they are their own individual self with their own likes and dislikes. And you have a a piece in nurturing them, but really they are uniquely them. And sometimes we can find that we butt heads with our kids and it can be very frustrating because they're not you just like any other person in the world. They are different from you. Oh yeah. So that's one of my favorite kind of readings to do is like a child reading where we're going in and just looking at the kid or the kids charts. And we're looking at, yeah, you know, here's what would be, here's, here's what would be very effective with this child and here's what they're working with. And here's some of the things that you could stand to back off about. Actually, I had a reading back before I was an astrologer myself and my daughter was three and she was very just, she had temper tantrums and there was nothing that we could do. And I went and got a reading and it was like, it changed the way that I parented her. The astrologer basically said, look, this is not a child that you're going to be able to parent in the traditional way in terms of setting rules that she has to follow. 
because she's going to butt heads with you every single time. But what you can do is you can learn how to move with her and you guys can decision make together. And like I said, I think that changed the trajectory of the way that I parent. And she is 14 now and she's still like that. She, she marches to the beat of her own drum. She does what she wants to do, but it's also, we've established this relationship where we're, we're working in tandem, right? It's like, she doesn't have to push against my rules because I'm there saying, okay, what would be the best decision for this thing and that thing? And total game changer. Yeah. It's almost like it gave you permission to be a different parent or to not have to follow the, the norm for parenting and really just cater your parenting style to her. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. And I, and it was such a relief. Like, yes. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, it was, it was interesting for me because my oldest daughter, I, oh my gosh, I can even, from the time she was little, there was just something about her that reminded me of my sister. And then the older she got, she's 11. Now I was just like, oh my gosh, you are my sister. Like I've said it so many times that it was just like, I can actually almost see it in my kids, how my oldest is very much like my sister and my youngest is very much like me. And so I pulled their charts and my sister and my oldest daughter have the same rising sign. Like they had so many similarities in their charts. I was like, oh, this makes sense, you know, but it was just like, I could almost see her in a different way. And I was like, I actually know how to manage you <laughs> because I managed my sister for so long. And we're very, we're, we're opposites. We have a lot in common, but we're also opposite in the way that we operate. And just by knowing that I was like, okay, I, it, again, like it gave me as myself, like permission to just be a little bit different. I, it's okay that I parent my kids differently because they are different themselves. Yes. And you know, astrology runs in families. So you totally described a phenomenon that I see all the time. Really? Which is like, yeah. I mean, it's like we come in, it, you know, if you imagine that we're in these soul groups and we're all traveling together all the time, it would make sense that then we come into these lives and we share some similar journeys and some similar things that we're working on. And a lot of times when we're looking at like the idea of what has been passed down to us through the ancestral line, um, it makes sense that, oh, this particular thing, this piece of work has shown up in a very similar fashion for people in the same family. And it's mm. always so cool to see that. Yeah. It's almost like that. I, I what the generational part of it. Right. And it's like, hmm, what lessons do we all have to learn too? Like, what are we all on this mission to learn and overcome? Yes, exactly. And I find that so often with parent child charts is that I'm looking and I'm saying, oh, you know, they're here to teach you just as much as you're here to teach them. So maybe like for you and me, some of our lesson from our kids is around being able to pivot in my case and do it differently or being able to um, really have some deeper understanding in your case that you call upon, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. And then also know, knowing that too, I can just because I know my sister, right? I'm like, oh, my daughter did this today. I can actually talk to my sister. And I think sometimes she understands it more or under can just give me like a different outsider scope on, on this little Scorpio rising that I just was not prepared for, you know? So it's interesting too, that I'm like, okay, you guys are similar. Give me some advice. Like how, how do I work with this? I love it. I love it. And I think that the way that we parent these days is changing for the better. You know, it's not, we're not doing the dictatorship anymore, or mm -hmm. at least I hope we're not. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, we're more like, okay, how can we partner with these little humans? They're humans still. Yes. How can we partner so that we are all learning and sort of um, having um, a content relationship together while we're all here? Yes. And that way we're not raising kids who are in their twenties, thirties, or forties, having to overcome all of this child trauma of exactly my mom forced me to do this, but I hated it. You know, <laughs> but, but she didn't listen to me. She didn't know me. Right. Because then you weren't in tune with 
with that child. And it's never a place I think of bad intention when, when you're in this mode, it's just, sometimes you just have to step back and it's that permission piece of being a different parent showing up in a different way. I do have a question about the moon and the sun when it, when it comes into relationships with that is I've heard that the, the father is represented by the sun and the mother by the moon. Is that true or yeah, yeah, that we, we would look at both of those as parent planets. And just to give you kind of a rundown, you know, another way to look at your son is around your relationship with your father, it, because it's the way that we perceive our relationship with our parents to be. And the son is about our self expression and being recognized and being seen. And so the son is the father that ideally is there sort of reflecting back to the child who they are. So the father that says, oh, you're so good at playing baseball or wow, that drawing is amazing or ooh, you're so cool on that swing, right? That's, that's an ideal father son where we're getting reflection and we form our sense of self through that reflection. And then the moon is about the, uh, our perception of the way that we were emotionally mothered. So we learn a lot about our own emotions and how to manage the world emotionally by how our mother manages our emotions and hers. Fascinating. So, yeah. So they're very, we can get very, very deep. We can look to understand, even if we didn't have, for example, like your mom and dad's birth data and charts in front of us, we could look at what is happening with your sun and moon in that respect to get a sense of what was going on for them and, mm -hmm. and what, how did you perceive it to be? Now, the, if someone had, let's say, um, a mom and dad and they kind of had different gender roles, maybe the dad was more nurturing and the mom was more of like in the masculine hustle type, could that show up in a chart too? Or is maybe the dad is represented by the moon or like how, how would that kind of play out? I mean, probably more likely what you would see is the sun in that chart having some connections to the nurturing signs and, mm -hmm. and the nurturing planets. And then we would see the moon in that chart as having um, more sort of harder aspects or more masculine aspects to it. Mm -hmm. So that's at least that's how I would read it. No, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm totally curious. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, I could go down so many different rabbit holes with all of my questions. And I know, you know, we could, we're limited on time as well. And I would love for you to join me for another conversation if you're up to it. But in the meantime, will you tell our audience where they can go to connect with you further? Yes. Okay. So you can find me at my website, which is Natha, N-A-T-H-A, Campanella.com. And, and I have a free ebook on the front page of my website. So you can click it and download it. If you're curious about some of these things that we've been talking about and you're like, I want to know my moon sign. I want to know my Venus sign. It will give you instructions for how to get that chart. And then there are some interpretations. So you can find that there. I'm also on Instagram, Natha underscore Campanella underscore astrology. And I do private readings. I teach a lot of classes. I have a monthly membership. So I have all sorts of stuff going on and I would love to come back more. And like, I feel like you and I could just talk for hours. <laughs> yes, I know. I like looked up at the time. I was like, I'm going to be respectful. I could probably pull out 10 more questions, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm going to be respectful of the time. Natha, thank you so much for sharing this ancient wisdom with us. There is always so much to unpack in the world of astrology and you have helped us pull back yet another layer. Thank you so much. Oh my God, my pleasure. What a great way to start my day. <laughs> Natha and I spent a few minutes talking after we finished recording and she helped me understand a few things in my chart with more depth and whoa, <laughs> she was spot on and provided me a lot of clarity. I'm excited to hear what resonated most with you in today's episode. Be sure to share your feedback with me on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. You can find me at MindBizLife. I've also linked Natha's website and social channels on this week's episode notes found on mindbizlife.com. And while you're at it, be sure to go ahead and hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, iHeartRadio, or wherever it is that you're tuning in from. That way you don't miss an episode. Your five-star ratings and reviews serve as great feedback to me, but they also help others find the podcast. 
I'll see you back here on Friday for another episode of Fuel Your Life Friday. But until then, remember, every level of life is an opportunity to grow. Be well, my friend.